Hey guys, there's Zeno coming up today on A to Z. Uh, winds of change are blowing for the Falcons, as well as wrong about this athlete, and a private thing should stay private next on A to Z. This is A to Z with Mark Zeno, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta. How did we get here? If you're not the number one pick, guess what? You have no guarantee. That's where you are. And it starts... Does that make me a genius? Yes. Now. Good afternoon. Welcome to A to Z here on Locked On Sports Atlanta, where today I tell you, you got to listen for the clues. Welcome in. We are live here on this Tuesday. Appreciate you guys joining me. Give us a follow on Twitter at Locked On ATL. I'm at Mark Zinno, M A R K Z I N N O. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Make sure you download Roku TV. Check out all the shows for Locked On Sports Atlanta right there as well. Appreciate you guys joining me. Uh, we have a lot to get to today, as always. And, uh, well, you know, it's interesting. Um, I tell you guys every Monday I go to the Arthur Smith press conference, and I'm, I'm never surprised what I learn from Arthur Smith. You know, um, it's and, – and the more I'm around him, the more and more I like him. I, I genuinely like Arthur Smith. Like, he's a guy that I want to go drink beers with um, because he's just very, very direct. Um, he absolutely, you know, smacks you with reality right in your face. And um, I appreciate the manner in which he is building – this team and the culture that he's building around him, you know, and, and I think to myself, sometimes I'm like, you know, Jenny, you felt this way about Dan Quinn. You really liked him, but th there's a difference. I did like Dan Quinn. The difference between Arthur Smith and Dan Quinn. And I want to put this delicately because I don't want to make it sound insulting, but Arthur Smith operates on a different brain level. And I think that's a difference between an offensive coordinator and a defensive coordinator, right? Like an offensive coordinator has a certain acumen. They have a certain brain power, uh, in the way their brain functions and the way they view things. Whereas defense coordinators can be a lot more emotional, right? They can be just rah, 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 just go out there and make a play. Be tough, be fast, be physical. They can tell you all those things. Offensive coordinators, they're schemers. They think, you know, they they, they work through problems. They their, their mind works like problem solvers. You know, everything is a chess game to them. Um, and, and, and so I think that's the difference. And, and I'm not saying Dan Quinn isn't smart. What I'm just saying is that Arthur Smith works through a different prism. And I think that's fair that offensive coordinators and defense coordinators work differently. All that said, you know, I have sat here for weeks and now months even telling you guys that, well, you know, um, that the quarterback debate was something that we shouldn't have, uh, that Arthur Smith has told you time and time again that Desmond Ritter isn't ready. He's told you time and time again that it's not always about the quarterback position. Yeah, he has told you all those things. Between Sunday and yesterday, Arthur Smith started to signal there might be a change in the thinking. That, you know, when you start talking about and you use certain words, we'll have some intense meetings, uh, is what he said. We'll do best with for short term and long term. You know, um, I, I think that there are clues you can pick up on that are starting to tell you that this is a real thing that there may be some debate about the starting quarterback and that all of you may get your wish that Ritter is going to play sooner rather than later don't know when it's going to be but it could be sooner rather than later um and you know part of uh, all of this is simply uh that Maybe, just maybe, as I've said for weeks now, that Arthur Smith has told us repeatedly that Desmond Ritter isn't ready, right? Well, maybe what he's doing uh, along the way is getting him ready, right? Like maybe on the side, he's been getting him ready. He's been doing extra things to prepare him for a time where he feels like he finally is ready, right? Like th that's an absolute, you know, possibility. And you guys are saying, ah, Zen, I told you so. You were wrong. You were wrong. Guys, I never said Ritter wasn't going to play. And I never said that he shouldn't play. What I said is that the coach told you he wasn't going to play. That's what he told us repeatedly. That he just wasn't there. Well, maybe the coach feels like he is there. And maybe it's time for that change to happen. I don't know. You, and listen, I don't think you're necessarily going to see any different results. I think that's fair. Um, but. Maybe there is a sense that 
Now is the time to just do it and see what happens. You know, Tampa Bay wins last night. And I actually asked Arthur Smith this. Does Tampa Bay and what they do have any bearing on the change? Because now you're a game and a half behind. If Tampa somehow beats San Francisco, they go up two full games with four to play. Um, that's tough. That's really tough because you don't have the division tiebreaker record over them, right? You're not, the Falcons are one and three in the division. They have a game left against the Saints and a game left against the Bucs. Um, and they're not in good position as far as tiebreakers are concerned, especially with a loss already to the Buccaneers. So that means they would absolutely have to beat the Buccaneers. Um, and oh, by the way, after division record, it's conference record. Even if somehow Tampa loses their last two divisional games and the Falcons win them, uh, Tampa is six and two in the division right now. Falcons are four and five. So, yeah, uh, Tampa would have to lose another divisional game along the way. So it's not likely that they could overtake the division. But anyway, I asked Arthur Smith that, and he said, no, it has nothing to do with it. So it's but with Tampa winning last night, you're starting to see the chances get slimmer and slimmer of the Falcons making the postseason and winning the division. And so maybe it's time to start signaling the winds of change that maybe now we finally do transition to Desmond Ritter. And again, like I said, you all can say I'm twisting words. No, I'm not. I, I will tell you, um, you know, I I will tell you succinctly that I never was against, um, I never was against, you know, Desmond Ritter starting. I was against the idea that the coach uh, was telling you something and you were ignoring it. So, you know, I, I think in general, it was very, very smart um, for Arthur Smith to be judicious about this. We, it was very, very smart, you know, that we should uh, take our time with it, that we should, you know, evaluate everything. And again, remember, you know, in the beginning of the year, things were different. For the first eight games, I think the Falcons were four and four. Um, yeah. And so the idea that, you know, a drastic change needed to be made at that point in time, I think was silly. In general, it was. You, you, you were ahead of where you, anybody thought you were going to be, including yourselves probably. So from all that standpoint, you know, I think that that when push comes to shove, Arthur Smith did this the right way. He did it his way, which I'm okay with, but he did it the right way. And I think it was, it was very, you know, very, very telling and deliberate the way he did this thing. And so uh, for somebody who was asking questions about, Mariota's aptitude early on and the and the, the problem in the passing game. I mean, I remember pointing this out after four weeks, the dichotomy of the fact that you were running for more yards than you were passing per game, and that was a problem. So, you know, um, we sit here, and it feels like the winds of change are blowing. And, and if the bye week, which feels like an opportune time um, to make the change, yeah, then no, no one should be surprised at this point in time. Um, it feels like it, it it could be coming. Who knows? We'll wait and see. But it certainly feels like it's something that is at least more on the table now than it was before. All right. Uh, I was wrong on something, and I'll get to that here in a minute. First, a word from our friends at betonline.net. Fastest and easiest way to check in on all your sports betting needs. Find your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. Find reviews and news of every league, including Major League Baseball, the NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, even golf. Bet Online continues to be the top online resource for all your sports wagering information from live in game betting scores and podcasts. They've got you covered. Head to Bet Online today or use your mobile device to learn more about the action that's happening today. Bet Online, where the game starts. Um, yeah. Game starts uh, for the Atlanta Falcons against the Saints in two weeks. And make sure to get ready for that game. You're listening to Locked on Falcons with Aaron Freeman. Make sure that that is your very first listen. Make your next listen the Locked on Sports Today podcast. Biggest stories of the day, instant reactions, big game recaps, plus the take of the day. It's available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. All right. Um, so I'll admit I was wrong on uh, Stetson Bennett. Uh, there's not much I can say other than I, regardless of the fact that I don't believe that he belongs in this conversation, he's there. So uh, yesterday it's announced that Stetson Bennett, uh, Caleb Williams from USC, Max Duggan from TCU, 
and C.J. Stroud were announced as the Heisman Trophy finalists. Uh, three of those four quarterbacks obviously are playing in the college football playoff. Uh, Caleb Williams is the odds-on favorite to win the award. He's at minus 2,500. So you get a good sense that it's probably his. But the idea that Bennett um, was there or is has been invited there tells you a little bit about at least what Heisman voters are valuing a little bit. Um, you know, this was floating around the interwebs and Twitter yesterday. Uh, and, and I'll bring it up just because I think it's 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 noteworthy. And, and although I don't necessarily agree with the way to judge a quarterback, uh, particularly a college quarterback in this whole thing, because there's a lot more that goes into it. Um, but I, I will tell you that what was floating around yesterday on the interwebs uh, was what Stetson Bennett's record was against um, teams ranked in the top 25. And Stetson Bennett had a 91 overall grade, a 90.5 passing grade. He was averaging 298 yards per game, throwing 17 total touchdowns, three and th- uh, 13 through the air, four on the ground, just two interceptions, and a 79% adjusted completion rate. Uh, and you know, he was also five and zero this year against teams ranked in the top 25. And so that was the context of which they were putting Stetson Bennett into the Heisman conversation, which again, I'm not necessarily opposed to, but that feels like one of those arguments where we talk about a guy for the hall of fame and, and focus mostly on his playoff stats, not his overall stats, Right. Like, it's almost the Kurt Schilling argument for the Hall of Fame. And no, I'm not going to get into Hall of Fame discussion. But it's one of those things where it's like Schilling's numbers in the postseason are so overwhelmingly dominant um, that it sort of dwarfs and diminishes what he did during the regular season, which his numbers in the regular season were very, very good. They weren't like, you know, bona fide Hall of Fame numbers, period. They just weren't. So... You know, if that's the argument for Stetson getting there, that he plays really well against the best competition, yes, I I think that counts. But when you're talking about a guy that's accounted for, you know, like 24 touchdowns all year long, when there are guys like Bo Nix who have accounted for 41, you know, C.J. Stroud who have accounted for 38, uh, uh, um, and and, uh, who else am I thinking of here? It slipped my mind right now. Um, Caleb Williams, sorry, duh, who's accounted for 40 on his own. like. You know, it just, to me, it falls a little bit short. And you could say I'm a hater, and that's fine. And and I know that, that you know, uh, you know everybody, that's what they'll say. Um, but whatever. I, I just, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm pretty objective about this stuff. Uh, and I don't feel like Stetson Bennett, uh, me leaving him out of the Heisman conversation, says by any stretch that he's a bad quarterback. This has nothing to do with him not being a good quarterback. He's a good quarterback. Just not a Heisman finalist in my eyes. That's fine. He's there. I, I was wrong. I say it now. I admit it. I was wrong. Okay. Obviously, Heisman voters think differently. They have a vote. I don't. They should get me one for the record, by the way. I feel like I deserve one at this point in time. But, you know, that'll never happen. And that's okay. It's totally, totally okay. I'm not, like, mad about it at all, honestly. But I just wouldn't have put it there. If I had five votes for the Heisman, I would have led with Caleb Williams. I would have had uh, probably uh, Max Duggan second, C.J. Stroud third, Hendon Hooker fourth. Uh, And I would have put a vote for Bo Nix in there. I I think, again, I think Bo Nix is getting shafted in this Heisman conversation. And I'm curious to see when the votes are released if he actually got any sort of attention. The year that he had in Oregon continues to go undervalued 100%. You know, I mean, it just is is unreal uh, how much we are, um, you know, not appreciating the season that he had. It was just really good. And again, I'm the only one who uh, is seeing that, I guess. But that makes me unique or wrong, depending on who you talk to, one or the other. I, I mean, theoretically, it could be both. Could be both. So uh, you'll get the announcement coming up uh, this Saturday um, at 8 o'clock in uh, New York at the uh, Touchdown Club, whatever it's called. Um, Bryce Young not going to be there again. 
it, it'll be uh, not going to be at the Heisman Trophy thing again. He won it last year, but a lot of people thought he might win it two years in a row. Look, I, you know, I'll, I'll look at it this way. One thing I said in the beginning of the year that the only place to place your money before the season started was C.J. Stroud. He was like plus 350 before the season started. Um, and I told everybody his odds were going to drop as soon as he throws a pass this year, and they did. And they stayed pretty much he was the favorite all year long. Um, and, yeah, uh, Caleb Williams overtook him. And even Caleb Williams – for all that he didn't do, I shouldn't say it, for, for, for not winning his Pac-12 title game, he still threw for 385 and a uh, and three touchdowns on a basically almost torn hamstring and bleeding. Uh, he did more than enough the final three games of the year to, to win the Heisman. I, I don't think there's any debate about that. Um, again, 4,000 yards, 37 touchdowns passing. How many did he have rushing this year? Oh, God, he had another seven touchdowns rushing. Let me see. Hold on. It might even be more than that. Yeah, he had 10 touchdowns. So he's responsible for 47 total touchdowns this year. It's just insane. In the last three games of the year, he went 470 for two touchdowns and a rushing touchdown. He went 232 for one passing touchdown, three rushing touchdowns. And then he went 363 for three touchdowns um, in the Pac-12 championship game. I mean, yeah, that's pretty darn impressive. So over his last three games, he accounted for 10 touchdowns, uh, just two picks, and 1,000 yards. Yeah, that's your Heisman winner right there. So even the games he lost against Utah the first time, he went for 381 for five touchdowns. And he went for 411 and another five touchdowns against Arizona. Like, he just – he got on fire midseason and never looked back. Um, and Georgia fans should actually – I think they should be thankful that, that uh, USC didn't make the playoff because – I 100% um, 100% believe that that offense could have given Georgia fits. We know that it already has. We, we saw it a couple of years ago in 2017 in the Rose Bowl when Lincoln Riley was at Oklahoma. They put up 45 or 51 or whatever it is uh, against Georgia in that game. All right. Uh, we're going to get to shovels of wisdom here in a moment. And, um, well, private matters need to stay private. But you've heard me tell you about them before. Have you guys tried built? Built Bar yet? Built Bar Puffs, they are delicious. Uh, you're depriving yourself of one of life's greatest joys if you haven't. They got a new flavor. It's called Cookie Dough Chunk. And what's great about it, it's got real chunks of cookie dough. It's covered in 100% chocolate. Only 160 calories, 15 grams of protein. These things are delicious. You can go to Built.com, snag a box for yourself and the family, or put them in your office desk. You know, they're great on the go. They're great late at night as a, as a simple snack. Um, they're, they're just fantastic. It's the best thing you guys can do for your health. And if you got a sweet tooth like me, it's you know it's a it's a great way to uh, feed that sweet tooth craving without all the guilt. Again, go to built.com, use the promo code locked on fifteen to get fifteen percent off your first order at checkout. Again, promo code locked on fifteen at built.com. Before we get to private matters that need to stay private, uh, we will hand out a shovel of wisdom. Brace yourselves because it's time for the shovel of wisdom. Yeah, you know how we do it every day. We have to reward somebody for saying or doing something stupid. Uh, you can do so on my Twitter account, at Mark Zinno, M-A-R-K-Z-I-N-N-O. And uh, today, my shovel goes to the Twitter account, Awful Announcing. I'm sure you guys are probably, if you're on Twitter, familiar with Awful Announcing. Um, they uh, just report on things going on in sports media, good, bad, or indifferent. Well, um, if you missed this last night, um, Unfortunately, uh, Hawks play-by-play -play announcer on Valley Sports South, uh, Bob Rathman, had uh, a medical episode last night and couldn't call the game. Props up to my buddy and pal, Lauren Jabbar, for stepping in uh, and prayers up to, to Bob Rathman for getting better or hoping he gets better. But Awful Announcing apparently posted the video of the actual episode that he had that was on air. Um, and you know, put the statement from Valley Sports Southeast. It said prior to tonight's game against the Oklahoma City Thunder, play the play announced that Bob Rathman briefly lost consciousness on court. Emergency medical professionals on site quickly treated Rathman for dehydration. And, you know, they took him to Emory and everything is good. And awful announcing posted the video, I guess, of him sort of, you know, passing out. I didn't see the video. I didn't even know it was up there. Um, but, you know, awful announcing eventually took the tweet down and then put an apology out there. Uh, saying that they shouldn't have done it. 
uh, and that they made a mistake in judgment. And here was their exact tweet. We appreciate the feedback on a decision to post a video. And after some additional thought on the matter, we've decided to delete it. We apologize for making an error and appreciate you guys keeping us honest. We should have been better and more thoughtful with that decision. Yeah, again, it's um, it's not uh, it, it wasn't pretty. I assume it wasn't pretty, you know, um, and somebody in the, in the comments responded, you should treat these with the same, you know, things you treat with a gruesome injury. No, you can you can replay gruesome injury all you want, in my opinion. Um, that's just part of sports. You have to deal with it. But somebody uh, having a, a medical episode that they can't control, um, you know, I, I think is a little bit of a different. Different ball of wax, you know, uh, you don't have to make somebody look like they're dying on TV like that, you know, is is sad. and You don't want to see that ever. Um, and so the broadcast quickly cut to commercial. Um, and then Kelly Kroll uh, reported that Rathman was doing OK. And again, props to Lauren Jabbar for stepping in and uh, and calling that game last night. Uh, LJ is my pal and, and she's fantastic at her job. So props up. And again, we hope Bob Rathman gets well. All right. Uh, staying with the Hawks here. <laughs> I kind of felt like something like this was coming. Uh, I don't know why. Again, uh, we've seen this already from Trey Young. You know, Trey Young got Lloyd Pierce running to town. We, we know that's pretty well documented by this point in time. Well, um, apparently Trey Young missed Friday's game because of a situation with Nate McMillan. As we understand the situation, um, it was that uh, Young wanted to focus on his treatment uh, and McMillan wanted him to be at shoot around on Friday morning prior to the game against Denver. Um, and Young wanted to focus on treatment. McMillan said, do it during the team's walkthrough. Um, and when Young declined to participate in shoot around, the coach offered him an option, either come off the bench or miss Friday's game entirely. Well, Trey Young decided to miss the game, and the team ruled him out right shoulder soreness. The Hawks have a rule that a player must participate in shoot-around in order to start a game. You know me, fan of rules. Uh, don't participate in shoot-around? Fine. You know, I mean, I'm sure that there's exceptions that can be made, but um, Trey Young was asked about it uh, and continued to say it was a private matter. It was made public. It was supposed to say private. It's a private matter. It was continued to, you know, be pressed on it. Um, and by Zach Klein of WSB. And he just, you know, you could tell that Trey was, was fairly uncomfortable with being pressed on it routinely. He wanted to just say it was a private matter and it was done. Uh, and, you know, very much um, a problem. Uh, Jeff Schultz, who covers uh, all things Atlanta for the athletic, um, said it very succinctly about Trey. His actions impact others and reflect on the entire organization. If he understands that, it's not shown in his words or his actions. And Jeff is right. Trey is a phenomenal player. But what is starting to become a little bit more apparent to me is that Trey is probably not the number one on a team. He's probably the number two. Like, you know. It was LeBron and Dwayne Wade, but it was LeBron the one, Dwayne Wade the two. LeBron and Kyrie, LeBron the one, Dwayne, uh, Kyrie the two. You know, Steph and Kevin Durant, like Steph was still the one, Kevin Durant was the two. You get what I'm driving at here? Like, if you're going to bring somebody in here to help with Trey, Trey probably shouldn't be the one. He's probably the two. And I think we're starting to realize that. Um, you know, it's leadership is a quirky thing, folks. Uh, it's leadership is making sure you do the things that others do. Uh, it's setting an example. It's, it's not that hard to sort of, you know, go to shoot around and, you know, fight your way through it a little bit. Um, and, and just suck it up. Like it, it's not a really hard proposition. And could McMillan have been a little bit more flexible? Sure. I mean, you know, treating a star. But again, what does that say to everybody else in the team? You know, uh, it says repeatedly that this guy is different than you. Uh, and you he doesn't have to do the things that you have to do. Like that, you know, I'm not sure that's a statement you want to send. And the problem is, is that Trey's accountability uh, on the whole thing wasn't what you want it to be. Um, he didn't say... I made a mistake. He didn't say, hey, it was on me. 
Um, and then he wanted to make it default to a private matter. It is a private matter. But nonetheless, it got out. So now you have to handle it as a public matter. You know? Um, he didn't turn around and say, you know, Coach and I had a disagreement. I have to own responsibility uh, for the disagreement on my part of it. You know, we've worked it out and it's done. He took no accountability, which is why he continued to get pressed on it. If he would have taken accountability for it, he doesn't get pressed on it anymore. That's the difference. Right? You know, owning something for yourself changes the narrative of questions. You keep saying it's a private matter. You keep deflecting from what, what actually happened. Either you're going to blame someone else or you're going to take responsibility for yourself. That's what saying a private, when your coded language for a private matter is, it's the other guy's fault, but I'm not saying that out loud. That's coded language for it. Okay. You know, like, it's that simple. That's what you were essentially saying. It was the other guy's fault, not mine. You want to take that stance? Knock yourself out. It's not leadership. It's not leadership. So, the Hawks may have a bigger problem with Trey on their hands. Uh, and, you know, I, I, if you want to be the alpha dog, you have to act like the alpha dog all the time. Not the, I'm a bad mf -er, and you just do what I say. It's not going to win you a championship with that attitude. Just won't. It's probably why Durant hasn't won one by himself. As the number one. Period. Guys aren't going out there fighting for him. And you have to start to wonder, are guys going out there fighting for Trey? It's fair at this point. He opened himself up to it. 100% opened himself up to it. And if you don't think so, well, I don't know what to tell you because I don't think you know what you're watching. Genuinely. Like, people show you through their actions who they are. Listen to them. Remember that? You know? People tell you who they are. Yeah. They're not lying. Remind you guys to make Locked On Falcons your first listen. For your next listen, check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast. Biggest stories of the day, instant reactions, big game recaps, plus the take of the day. It's available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. That'll do it for A to Z today here on Locked On Sports Atlanta. Back tomorrow for Wednesday show. You guys have a wonderful Tuesday. Don't take any crap from anybody. See ya. <laughs>